Good morning, everybody. And thanks for getting here on a Sunday morning. Um, I'm just putting this on so I don't, I tr also that I try not to go over time, but please indicate if I, if I need to shut up. So, um, I was asked and actually given the honor to talk about women in Pan-Africanism. When I saw that on the program, I thought, oh my gosh, who's doing that? I wondered, and then Claudette said, would you do it? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm really pleased about that I was asked to do that. Um, and, on, and look at also within Pan-Africanism, we are quite aware about the, um, the, the male relationship to women in Pan-Africanism, the balance and that kind of imbalance. Um, so well, I'll just kind of refer to some of the more prominent women who are in the movement starting from the, the 45 conference and some lesser well-known women might have played a role in Pan-Africanism as well. Mainly from an arts perspective, I'll be looking at things because that is really where my specialization and passion lies. One of my mottos is art is the heart of the nation. And I sincerely believe that art educates heals, breaks down borders and bridges beliefs. I work, love, teach through art, which is why for me creating display with poetry, with Pan-African poets is important. As so many of the Pan-Africanists uh, are and were word wordsmiths, but trying to find women amongst them is difficult. But I also wanted to show that Pan-Africanism is on our doorstep and is far more than the intellectual, is far more than an intellectual exercise. As much as art is in part of our everyday lives, so is Pan-Africanism. Um, so two of Garvey's, I'm going to be mentioning, of course, Garvey's wise, two of his main notable quotes linked to art, poetry. You should also read the best poetry for inspiration. The standard poets have always been the most inspirational creators. From a good line of poetry, from a good line of poetry, you may get the inspiration for the career of a lifetime. Many a great man and woman was first inspired by some attractive line or verse of poetry. Another one of Garvey's quotes is, a reading man and woman is a ready man and woman. But a writing man and woman is exact. So two, uh, both of his wives were, 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 were Pan-Africanists, Amy Ashwood Garvey. I won't say too much. I mean, we talked about them yesterday. And at least they are, are noted. You will find information about them online. But his first wife, Amy Ashwood Garvey, uh, is also regarded as a co-founder of the UNIA and co-builder. And she was very active in organizing the first conference and in fact chaired the first, chaired the first session. And his second wife, also Amy, is on record as the person publishing the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. Um, I'm, what I'd like to actually suggest, I will suggest to Claudette, giving her some more work to do, um, is that the speakers including yourself, Mr. Gutsmore, includes that the speakers give like two books to put on a reading list that we can be sent out to everybody. One of them, a poetry book, <laughs> and another like any other book that they think is good that people can share and read. And we can just send it round to everybody and people can just pick and choose what they read. But I just think that'll be, from what we've had, for those people who've been here Friday night and Saturday, so much, so much rich material has come out. I think that's kind of a sharing from all of us to everybody who's been in attendance to have this, to have this book list. But I'm also grateful to academics such as Carol Boyce Davis, um, to, who, who's contributing an article uh, to a book I'm working, I'm putting together called the 21st of February, Progress and Possibilities of a Pan-African Future. She has written on feminism and Pan-Africanism. So she's written about both Garvey women. She's also written about the Trinidadian Claudia Jones. Claudia Jones is an, um, and uh, Carol is an expert on, on, on writing around Claudia Jones. Claudia Jones was a woman who started two major things in the UK, the Notting Hill Carnival 
and she was also editor of the West Indian Gazette. And this, this year is the centenary of, uh, of her birth. And she was also born on 21st of February. But I've got some postcards people can pick outside. I won't go into too much detail of why the, of why the book is called 21st of February, Progress and Possibilities of a Pan-African Future. Um, but also a friend of mine, Dorothea Smart, who's also a poet, she recently returned from Panama um, researching her poetry book and actually discovered that Panama has, still has the greatest number of Garveyite branches in the world, I think there's a, um, which is a weird place to kind of, for that to kind of come out. Um, and I just mentioned Dorothea and her work because there's also a fantastic book that has come out this year by another Jamaican woman writer, Olive Senior. And she, because this year, I think it was this year, no, last year was the 100th anniversary of the Panama Canal, which is, um, which is a main factor in our, in our history. And Olive Senior wrote about that. And she actually said some of the work that Dorothea has written on is a continuation of, of some of the work that, that she did. But I also mentioned the book, not just because I'm promoting the book, <laughs> which will be out to the 21st of February next year. But four of these things, four things were important for me in putting together a book like this. Number one, that all the contributors were to be of colour. Yes, I do know and respect a lot of white academics who could have also contributed to this book. But for me, when I was at university in the 80s, I studied West African studies. And it was only in my final year, and probably the final months, was I given a book by a black academic, Samira Amin, and neocolonialism in Africa. All the other books were by white writers. And if I didn't agree with them, you know, I got a bad mark, basically, because some of the things I was a little bit suspect about. So for me, it was important to have a book on Pan-Africanism with all black contributors. It's also important to have at least 40% women in there. I'm into gender balance. Um, and what I would do is every time, and I didn't kind of do a, pu a public call for commission, I, I kind of like asked people who I knew and then asked them to recommend somebody who was of a different gender and of a different ethnicity. So we got a real balance. Because how am I going to have a book on Pan-Africanism and I couldn't have all people from the continent or all people from America? It didn't make sense. I wanted this real spread, which I think I've got. It was also important for me to have a woman publisher. Um, in fact, a lot of uh, independent publishing is, is done by, by black women. But it is important for me to have a woman publisher. Again, it's a book that was kind of showing where we are as as black people and also showing what kind of um, <coughs> things that, the, uh, that black women were doing. Um, and I've also mentioned the fourth thing, that the contributors did come from across the diaspora. So my publisher is a woman called Janice Kearney. She's in Arkansas. She, was, she, was, uh, she also started newspapers in Arkansas. Uh, what did she, well, she, uh, well, she was publishing uh, um, papers in, in Arkansas and she was um, Bill Clinton's diarist. Um, so she has a lot of avenues open to her where she, where she gets her, her books um, distributed. Just to mention a few other women um, of the Pan-African past, Adelaide Caisley Hayford, who dedicated her life to the education of girls in Sierra Leone. She was born Adelaide Smith. She died in 1960. She was married to the well-known Pan-Africanist J.E. Caisley Hayford. And they had a daughter called Gladys Casey Hayford, who was a West African writer, poet, musician, and dramatist, painter, and storyteller. She was, she was their daughter. Um, and another thing I kind of would note as I was doing some reading is that quite often the women um, in Pan-African, uh, Pan-Africanism at that time, were called cultural, nation cultural nationalists. The men were Pan-Africanists. We were cultural nationalists. I think, you know, we always got to be careful of language we use. I don't have no idea why they shouldn't have been Pan-Africanists. They were doing just as much, so there we go. Uh, Gladys Casey Hayford was a, was a well-known poet, as noted as a well-known poet. She was also, uh, people think that she may very well have been a lesbian. Um, I just make a point of that, uh, just noting that, because we have had some discussions that have come up over the weekend about LGBTQ 
and and um, both in terms of lesbianism and homosexuality and how it is in our community. It is something that I think that we're going to have to just get on with. I mean, I, I don't mean to say this in a very um, uh, in a very um, throwaway kind of manner, but at the end of the day, in terms of having people in our community who are going to contribute and people on the continent who are going to contribute in Pan-Africanism, it's more important about what they do than their sexuality, I believe. Um, there are also Pan-African women that there will be many of them who did a lot of grassroots work who we may never know about. Mainly sometimes because they were illiterate and they, weren't writ they didn't write and because people didn't write about them. But there, we just kind of know that there would have been quite a lot of women and, and possibly men as well that we don't know who are very active. But make no mistake about the power of the women in the movement. That phrase behind every great man, there is a woman, we can see that in Garvey's case. I'm not saying women are perfect behind every bad man. There's probably also a woman you don't know. Um, moving on to more recent women who are revered in Pan-Africanism and not always seen initially as Pan-Africanists. We have women like Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou has written, uh, wrote 36 books. In 1960, in 1960, she moved to Cairo where she served as editor of the English language of the English language weekly, the Arab Observer. The next year, she moved to Ghana, where she taught at the University of Ghana School of Music and Drama, and where she worked as a feature editor for the African Review and wrote for the Ghanaian Times. During her years abroad, Dr. Angelou mastered French, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, and Fanti. While in Ghana, she met with Malcolm X, and in 64, returned to America to help him build his new organization of African American unity. Another one of my favorite Pan-Africanist women who she recently passed away was Jane Cortez, also um, an African-American poet. She set up African Women Writers Networks around the world with another woman, Ama Atta Aidu. The first conference called Yari Yari Pamberi, which means the future, and uh, Pamberi, and, uh, it, mean, it means the future, and means looking forward in Kuranko and Shona African languages. And that first conference was um, on black women writers dissecting globalization in New York. Um, and I was lucky enough to hear about it and be there. And it was just such an amazing presence in Manhattan. And it, we just kind of felt like the women stepping out there, we just kind of like felt like we owned New York at that time. And it was just like, it was amazing to be there. And we were just always waiting for the next one, which finally was held in Ghana in 2013, which was called Yari Yari Entasal, which means understanding and agreement um, in the Akan language. I'm just sorry, going to, so I don't go over time, just skip some of what I had here. Hmm. I think another issue uh, that women of recent past have had to deal with, with some of the women I have spoken to, mainly in the arts, so I'm not going to say this is women across the board. Um, they've said this to me personally. Is for, for example, in the things like the black arts movement that Jane Cortez was around at that time, was that when they would perform, when they were like doing performance poetry, women were quite often uh, put lower on the bill and quite often given less time um, as, as, as the male poets were done and if they were paid they were sometimes paid less as well I'm just kind of mentioning this because it might not that kind of thing might not be written anywhere you see the pan-african movement the, pa the sorry the black arts movement we kind of think that everything was was hunky-dory and that there was a lot of equality there and we've got to acknowledge We've got to believe that we know at the end of the day, when it comes to women and men in the Pan-African movement, there has not always been equality. And there isn't equality. And that's something we continually have to work with. One of the situations, for example, that, that happened to myself, the first time I met Dr. Hakim Adi was on a panel. 
at the mayor's office in London, and this was to um, this was to commemorate the 50th anniversary of independence. So I was on an all-male panel, and I'd been asked to commission. I'd been commissioned to write a poem on Pan-Africanism, and we started a little bit late. And the organiser came up to me and said, well, I know you have like 10 minutes to read your poetry. Do you think you can cut it to five? And I said, no. I said, I was commissioned to write this poem. I did it. I didn't charge you. And why don't you just cut the 10 minutes at the end so everybody gets cut? Why do you have to cut me? And thank goodness Boris Johnson stood up and said, yes, I agree with Khadija. Thank goodness. Do you know what I mean? So even, and this was not very long ago, so even now, we are still contending with these issues, you know? So what I would urge, especially with young women to do, don't feel embarrassed about standing up for yourself. Don't hide your light under a bushel, as Mandela says. We have to stand up for ourselves. And sometimes you might be the only one there doing it. And sometimes people might think you're too, as you say in Sierra Leone, you're too one kind. So what? <laughs> you know? But we have to do it, yeah? Um, some of the women, other notable women I could mention, Angela Davis, women know, Asata Shakur. Um, personally, I pray that she's going to be OK in Cuba now that America has kind of opened up their relations. I'm sure they're going to try and hunt her down. Because last year, she was, uh, it was, she was named again as the most dangerous woman in America, even though she hasn't lived there for many years. She's lived in Cuba. So um, I just pray that she will be OK. And um, other women currently in Pan-Africanism. There are women like Amma Baine. Um, it is unfortunate we didn't get to hear her at this conference. She was, um, she was originally supposed to be here. She's one of the leading Pan-Africanists in the country, I believe. And she's also she's an expert on the life of and Kwame Nkrumah. That's what, that's, that's what she studied. I'll also mention people like Wanguri Wangoro. She's a leading translator, and she set up an organization to promote translation <coughs> in African languages. She translated Ngugi Wationgo's first book. Um, so she is worth knowing about, and please look her up. Other women, Margaret Busby. Margaret Busby is, uh, was one of the first, she was the first black woman publisher in this country, and the youngest woman publisher. And what is so amazing about Margaret Busby, she is just such a humble person. You always see her at events taking pictures. She is archiving all the time. She's always taking pictures of everybody. She edited an anthology called Daughters of Africa, um, which you probably can't buy now, but you can get it from the, uh, from the library. Please, if you have an opportunity, please read it. She goes from as far back as she can looking for African women writers up until the present time. And this is women of African descent. Nawal El-Sadawi is a writer and activist, Egyptian. I fell in love with Nawal myself. The first time I heard her speak, I went to Paris. It was Wangui who took me. She said, hey, you haven't heard of, uh, of Nawal El-Sadawi? She took me to Paris to listen to her for International Women's Month. And as I walked into this packed room, Nawal said, I'm not here as an Egyptian woman. I'm here as an African woman. Egypt is in Africa. It's not in the Middle East. What is the Middle East? Who called us Middle East? Is there a Middle West? <laughs> Nawal's coming to the uh, country next week. Unfortunately, her publisher only booked her stuff in London. I did bring her. I don't know who was here in March. You saw her when I brought her here in, in, in March. But if you can get the opportunity to see her, please do, because she's uh, mid-80s now, um, so we never know when she, if she's going to be here again. I, I do have the details of her itinerary. I can like, put it up on, on Facebook or something so that people have the opportunity to see her. We have people like her own organizer here, Colette Williams. Um, to me, she's now a giant in my eyes. I've organized things for many years. And for her to have got this together underneath the circumstances, I'm telling you, is no small thing. Um, and I just give her thanks for her generosity. We only kind of met online, on the phone, not very long ago. We have also had people like Zeta Holben, who was here yesterday. And Zeta has done so much in the trade union movement. Zeta 
is bringing out her own poetry book soon. Please look out for it. We also have, you also have in Manchester, I did not know about this elder, Chief Eloise Edwards. It's so nice coming to places and learning about all of these people. I'm also going to mention my friend who I stay with, Marilyn Comrie. My gosh, this woman is just like a powerhouse. Again, time won't permit me to go into, into too much, but please look her up if you have the time about some of the work that she's done and continues to do. She's now doing stuff around sports um, uh, and, and uh, racing and pushing women in that area. And of course, we talked about um, in the future and women in the future for Pan-Africanism in the future. And um, even though, yes, I agreed with Lee Jasper from yesterday that the youth need to move forward and we need to hand over the baton at 55, he was pensioning himself off. That is so sad. <laughs> you know, I'm nearly 53. I think I'm like, uh, I'm just about to begin, <laughs> you know? Because at the end of the day, we have to be there to still be there as mentees for the youth and to help them. And hopefully they will learn from our mistakes, you know? So we need to be there and we still need to use our energies. Maybe Lee doesn't know this. I will tell him that 50 is the new 30, okay? Um, so there are just many women who are still doing things and still have that strength that at amazing ages. People like, as I said, Noel, she's in her 80s. When she was here in March, she was here for a couple of weeks. She goes, oh, Khadija, they want me to go to, to Jakarta for a festival. So I'll just go to Indonesia and then I'll come back again. And I'm like, no, you're not, you know. I said, there are no direct flights. I had to kind of explain the logistics to her that that was going to really wear her out, you know. And we want to keep her whole for, for as long as possible. So she's just ready to get on a plane to be where she feels she needs to be. Um, so I think we do have, still have great opportunities to do women in the future, younger women. I'm still a, a young woman. But as well, I, I just think as well, I'm very lucky with the name of Khadija, because I do have to mention Mohammed's wife, Khadija, in terms of Islam, because, you know, she became a Muslim before Mohammed did. And Mohammed was just sensible marrying this woman, you understand? And, you know, but also she recognized that by supporting him, that he was going to move forward and spread Islam throughout the world. But that probably wouldn't have happened. It may not have happened, we don't know, if it hadn't been for Khadija. So I think we always have to, you know, uh, make sure that we are uh, looking out where women are making some significant significant impact. Um, it was when I spoke to Colette during the week and she mentioned this young woman to me who spoke yesterday. Wow, five minutes, okay. I will just mention them very quickly then. Uh, Temi, Temi Mawale, oh my gosh. It's just, if you didn't see her yesterday, then you missed something wonderful. She's, she, she's great. The new young poet of, of London, she is also, her name is Selina Nrulu. She is a very powerful young woman. Please read her stuff. Also, Colette's daughter, we learned yesterday she had an MSc in chemistry. That's pretty wonderful. So there are a lot of young women who are just raring to go and we need to support them to move forward. So because I only have five minutes left and because I, I wouldn't be me if I didn't finish with a poem, I'm finishing with two poems, so I'm gonna read them quickly, but <laughs> the first one I'm gonna read, and one thing that my friend Dorothea always does, which I think is brilliant, whenever she starts a poetry reading, she reads somebody else's poem so that we learn about somebody else's. I'm gonna read a very short one of mine, and then I'm gonna read one of, or maybe just part of one of Jane Cortez's poems. So this is a poem called Rice. The first time I went back home, I returned with country rice, small grains that sifted like tiny diamonds, coarse and flecked with variant browns like gravel, not like the own brand that shed milky white starch into water, long grained, fluffy and soft, 
that we eat on Sunday afternoons. But mum said, I don't cook that unpolished rice anymore, and threw it away, a bit like our language. I'm going to read you a bit of a poem from Jane Cortez, and when you hear it, you'll see why I think she's so amazing. So please give me a one minute yeah. wind yes, up. Please do go ahead. For the brave young students of Soweto. Soweto, when I hear your name, I think about you like the fifth ward in Houston, Texas. One roof of crushed oil drums on the other. Two black hunters in buckets of blood walking into the fire of Sharpville. Into the sweat and stink of gold mines. Into your children's eyes suffering from malnutrition. While pellets of uranium are loaded onto boats. Head for France, for Israel, for Japan. Away from the river so full of skulls and Robin Island so swollen with warriors and the townships that used to overflow with such apathy and dreams. And I think about the old Mau Mau grieving in beer halls and the corrupt black leaders singing into police whistles. And I think about the assembly line of dead Hottentots and the jugular veins of Allende. And once again, how the coffin is divided into dry ink. How the factory moves like a white cane, like a volley of bullet in the head of Lumumba. And death is a deaf life held together by shacks, by widows who cry with their nipples pulled out, by men who shake with electrodes on the tongue. And Soweto, when I hear your name and look at you on the reservation, Aosa in the humid wrinkles of Shreveport, Louisiana, walking down Fannin Street, into the bottom hole, into wall of endurance. I smell the odor of our lives together made of tar paper. The memories opening like stomachs in sawmills. The faces growing old in cigarette burns. And I think about the sacrifices made in Cape Town. The sisters being mauled by police dogs while the Minister of Justice rides the tall ship of torture down the Hudson River in New York, while vigilantes under Zulu masks strike through the heartland like robots in military boots with hatchets made of apartheid lips. And Soweto, when I look at this ugliness and see once again how we've divided and forces into fighting each other, over a funky job in the sewers of Johannesburg, divided into labor camps, fighting over damaged meat and stale bread in Harlem, divided into factions fighting to keep from fighting the ferocious men who are shooting into the heads of our small children. When I look at this ugliness and think about the Native Americans pushed into the famine of tribal reserves. Think about the concentration camps full of sad Palestinians and the slave quarters still existing in Miami and the diamond factories still operating in Amsterdam in Belgium. The gold market still functioning on Wall Street and the scar tissues around our necks swelling with tumors of dead leaves. Our bodies explode like whiskey bottles as the land shrinks into the bones of ancestor bushmen. And I tell you, Soweto, when I see you stand up in the middle of all this, stand up to exotic white racists in their armored churches, stand up to these land stealers, infant killers, rapists and rats, to see you stand among, among the pangas, the stones, the war clubs, the armadillos dying along this roadside, to see you stand with the ocean, the desert, the birthright of red cliffs, to see you stand with your brave young warriors, courageous and strong-hearted, looking so confident in battle marks, coated in grief and gunmetal tears, to see you stand up this epidemic of expansion and flame passbooks into ashes, fling stones into the mouths of computers, to see you stand on the National Bank of America like monumental sculpture made of stained bullets, to see you stand empty-handed, your shoulders open to the world, each day young blood falling on the earth, to see you stand in the armed struggle next to Mozambique, Angola, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Soweto, I tell you Soweto, when I see you standing up like this, I think about all the forces in the world confronted 
by the terrifying rhythms of young students, by their sacrifices and the revolution that it won't be long now before everything in this world changes. Thank you. It's been a long time now. I've been watching brothers battling, struggling and fighting to survive in so many ways. And those of you not living in designated war zones, on the way to work or to school, or even whilst you should be safe in your homes, I see how hard it is for you just to get by. Respect to each and every one of you who continues to try. I believe in his history, his destiny and purpose. Curse the detractors, defectors and haters. I am an African woman who believes in the African man. Black, powerful, Kemetic, Kushite, Nubian, Pharaoh, Asantahini, Kabaka, Oba, Sakari, Nigas Nagast. Brothers, claim your titles, magnificent, present, future, and past. And with great power comes great responsibility to revere our heritage, culture, and spirituality. I believe in his history, his destiny and purpose. Curse the detractors, defectors and haters. I am an African woman who believes in the African man. Understand. So my beautiful brothers, make our nation proud. Do it now, shout it loud. Tell your sisters, your mothers and your daughters that you pledge to love and to protect and to support us. Show that you are knowledgeable and wise. Compassion, strength, creativity and guile are all the traits that have helped you to survive and thrive. First man, homo sapien sapien, glistening with melanin. Many shapes, sizes and tones. Love you all to the bone. I believe in his history, his destiny and purpose. Curse the detractors, defectors and haters, because me, I'm an African woman who believes in the African man. Thank you. So finally, this poem that I'm going to do is short, but it's inspired by what I heard from my sister, actually. Uh, from what you were it just like resonated, so I thought I'd pull this one out. This is called They and We. How many more times will they steal, rape, and plunder, violate, appropriate, disassociate, assault, and incarcerate, stipulate that they are the greats? Make no mistake, they strive to create a single narrative that to those of us who know is comparative to a fairy tale, but designed to captivate the minds of those already enslaved. They know no boundaries. They act without conscience nor impunity. They have no morality nor integrity, questionable humanity. They are twisted in their reasoning, justifying the unjustifiable. They are corruption personified. This is undeniable. They wield their dishonesty, manipulation, and lies cold, heartless eyes, blunt acts, destined for a vicious decapitation. Only this is done to nations, ancient civilizations of the global south. They are the harbingers of destruction, famine, and drought. They decimate, explode bombs that eradicate, making every attempt to annihilate history, language, culture, a kind of vulture, preying on the weakest, most vulnerable, and defenseless. They cultivate greed, gluttony, and excess. They salivate as they take more than they need, fill their plates till they spill, their cups overflow. But for them, it's just tally-ho, and off we go, and please don't ruin our flow. For millions are starving, quite frankly, we don't want to know. Trust. They begrudge even sharing the crust of stale bread, never mind cake. They don't give, they only take. They suffocate us, violate us, use every trick to create the confusion, the illusion of justice and equality, perpetrating the myth of democracy. They are the system controlled by Freemasons and Bilderbergs, the state, 
the pharmaceutical Zionists and bankers, multinational corporates, disproportionate wealth and power, some say Illuminati, prima facie, it's the new world order. We are the many, and they are the few, and centuries of reparations are due to us, for we must always mistrust their demon erratic opportunistic doublespeak, because for us, the minoritized, excluded, disenfranchised, the poor, this spiel is yet another tactic to ensure that we remain at the back door, whilst they retain our resources, from sugar, coffee, tobacco and tea, the most important staples in every Western country, to diamond, copper, coltan, gold, zinc, oil and titanium, uranium, all plundered and robbed, stolen to build their Elysium. Yet, we are never invited to tea, to sit at the table, to partake of the feast. Instead, we are afforded the status of beast, beast of burden designed for the fields, the factories, the workhouses. Our function, to produce yields, pounds, euro, dollars, the working class, blue collar. Yet we see no benefit, no profit, no gain. Instead, we feel the effects of exploitation, like acid rain, destroying our lives, health, and well-being. Disintegrating communities, pouring this unity again and again and again. Yet, for all that we have been through, and for all that we have lost, many battles have been won, though at high cost. We've done it before, us runaway slaves. Mm -hmm. We defiant poor have never behaved. And life shows us history is a cycle, nothing new under the sun. Revolution, the t earth's ever turning. Darkness, not permanent. Dawn will return like the prodigal son. Or without gender bias, a daughter. Destined to be the one to end the slaughter, holocaust and genocide. Eugenics, freak economics, environmental catastrophes and pseudoscientific fallacies. But we don't need to wait for saints, saviors and prophets. For each and every one of us has the power to stop it. Our combined and unified potential would be a force so phenomenal, overwhelming and indestructible, that we could move mountains, part seas, be the pinnacle of equality, justice, and peace. We, the masses, must keep fighting for our freedom, for our release, from the shackles and the gags employed to shut us down, MI5 to the FBI and every kind of ply that they, try to, they use to try to silence our voices, our words, but we will never be unheard. Truth is true as day and night, and we have the power to bring the light. Thank you. Greetings, family. Greetings, Greetings family. Greetings. Okay, someday we can go to church. We can. I actually did go to church this morning. I, I went to the wrong venue, but I'm here. Um, and. In doing that, I did miss the beginning of Khadija's uh, talk, and one of the sisters, I'm not sure she mentioned, has been very influential in my journey coming today. Um, sister Esther Stanford Jose, who I'm sure some of you know. Give that sister a round of applause. And it's, it's because of Khadija, it's because of Sister Esther and other groundings with my sisters that I am here today, because I studied here 20 years ago. Um, and I was telling people who, who I've spoken to, Brother Abraham, I studied the dark art of advertising in this very institution. So I broke away from that with the help of people like Khadija, studying that uh, capitalist monetary you know, path. And I've reorientated onto a path of fulfillment and uh, well-being. I'm still on that journey. Oh, I wasn't going to advertise, but yes, there we go. That, that's, that's my book, Ad Liberation, coming out. But I'm not talking about that today. Um, but yeah, I, I think following on from the discussions about where we are, uh, climate change and justice is the topic. Um, it's worth noting that we are in an academic institution. I think one of the things that has been imparted to me with my dialogues with Sister Esther, Brother Kofi Clue, others, is the... The idea of breaking down these institutions, these hierarchies. So I recognize I'm here as a presenter, but I, I'm very interested in dialoguing with everyone. 
I think some of the best conversations I had yesterday, in fact, they were with, took place in the dinner time outside of the conference. Um, I know that there's a limited time for people to ask questions. Some of the questions we had yesterday from the floor, uh, you know, incredible knowledge that we have within this room. So I will speak on this issue, but I, I, it'd be great to, to have input from everyone else on this huge topic that no one, I'm not claiming expertise on this. I, I will impart what I know and what's been imparted to me, but it's a dialogue with the whole family. Um, and in breaking this down, I think this, this hierarchical structure of tiers, me as an expert speaker, uh, let, let's look at that because that is, that is a climate that has been imposed on us, I think. If you look at educational institutions and the way that we have debates, the debating culture, the argument culture, there was a, book, there was a toolkit I helped produce with Sister Esther and Brother Kofi in 2007, cross-community dialogue. And within that, one of the African forms of dialogue um, it referenced is the legotle. Do people know that? That form from Botswana? Uh-huh. <laughs> Excellent. Do, do you want to speak on that? Uh, it's where we, everybody, uh, we talk about gender here, men and women, we all sit together, including anybody and everybody in the village, and we sort out issues that affect the village. There is no, and everybody we say, and so on, everybody where it's wet. There's no, there's no hierarchy. We are all there, we all thrash out whatever we talking about, and we are okay, that's, that's the essence of the point. Excellent. There we go. One more time, so I've got a pronunciation. Le Khotla. Le Khotla. Thank you very much, brother. And one of the principles I understand in that as well is that these dialogues take place within a circle. Mm -hmm. We have eye contact. We see each other. That's important. Um, we listen. And another important aspect is that it takes place outside in the environment which is, we talk about climate justice and change. Um, we have, we're in a windowless building here. I think getting out into the environment to actually, as, as one of the brothers said yesterday, who are you not to salute the wind? Who are you not to salute the trees? You know, we, we need to recognize ourselves as living, breathing human beings and interact with that nature and sometimes sit with that nature and listen. So bearing that in mind, we are here and I'm gonna get into this topic. Um, so climate change, that as a phrase maybe does not spark off uh, things in our community as, as an urgent issue in terms of uh, maybe it's, it's been co-opted, that word climate change. When, I look, when we look at the activism that's around there, we see people like Greenpeace, we see movements, um, people jumping on rigs, people saving the whales, the polar bears. You know, that, that is the dominant narrative I think we have about climate change, we see mainly white faces engaged in this. But as we know, the people who are directly affected by changing climate, by sea level rises, my own father's island of Barbados, the Caribbean, by droughts, by deserts, by floods, those are people who are on the margins, as Audrey Lord, um, Audrey Lord says in the uh, poem, um, Litany for Survival, those on the shorelines. So we, we, our people are going to be at the forefront of these changing environments that we're coming into. As well as that, as well as being the, the people who are going to be most affected, our people are the people who are least responsible. If we look at historically the processes that have brought us to this brink, we're looking at those processes from the Industrial Revolution. We're looking at uh, colonies. We're looking at Columbus's journeys. We're looking at the destruction of land, destruction of fauna, destruction of peoples, destruction of traditional ways of living with the planet in harmony with the earth and with nature. So we need to address that. So the reason I titled this climate change and justice is because that word justice needs to be in there, needs to be in the discussion. Often climate change is, is the thing that we see on the, on the news and it's, it's, it's ju the justice aspect is missed off when that is critical. So we have a uh, conference coming up in Paris, which I think 
Sister Zita mentioned yesterday that the Paris talks, the, these big climate talks which happen, big states come and talk about the climate and resolutions are passed and nothing changes. Within those conferences, the idea of justice needs to be raised and needs to be to the fore because, as we said, without our voices, that those decisions are going to be made for us. And I need to mention that this is a reparations fight. This is all connected. I was having conversations yesterday about the idea of reparations and what we, uh, again, are often shown is that reparations is about money. That, that's a big that's a big narrative that's being pushed on us. Reparations is compensation, the monetary aspect of reparations. Whereas reparations is not about that at all. That is one tiny aspect. Money is the, the, the tiniest aspect of reparations. Reparations is about doing for ourselves. It's about holistic repair. It's about repairing our relationships within our family, repairing our relationships within society, within other people, repairing our relationships with the land, with the water, with the food, with justice. Just repair. That key word there is repair. One other aspect, I mentioned food. I was having a discussion yesterday about, about food. And um, props to uh, Spike Lee for naming his, his uh, production company. Who knows the name of Spike Lee's production company? Exactly, 40 acres and a mule. And in, in reading about that, that term, you know, that was a reparations demand that we have that in America, the former enslaved Africans demanded that they get land from the former plantation owners. And that was, that was a bold demand. 40 acres is a lot of land, if you think about how much we're talking there, and the mule. That didn't happen, as we know. Today, we have 40 betting shops and an Obama. We have 40, yeah, that's it, 40 chicken shops and a... Yeah, that's it, and a Chava Phillips. 40 liquor shops and a filling your own. So land is key to this idea of climate justice change. Land, sea. Um, we're in the month of October, and coming up, there's another key anniversary. Like I say, it's 20 years since I was studying in this institution. And in my studies, I was blind to this narrative from a um, climate justice pioneer and hero. Um, it was front page news, but I was plugged into advertising, to cars, to chasing money, whatever else. And I, I miss this narrative, but on the 10th of November this year, it marks the execution of Ken Sarawiwa and eight of his Ogoni colleagues. And I'm, I'm seeing lots of nods of people who, who know that, that story. And, and that's, that's an important climate justice story and ongoing reparations action that, that needs justice. Because the Niger Delta, people who are from the Niger Delta, from Nigeria, that is one of the, um, one of the areas which is most under attack from the forces of colonialism, imperialism, and all the thems. This, this, is, this, is a, you know, this is a fight that, that has seen oil taken from that community. Uh, the Agoni was, was a fishing community, a very small community compared with the whole of Nigeria. And the, the oil has been taken from that land for decades. Nothing has been put back. Shell oil particularly has taken this. And there's other communities in the Delta which have also suffered under Chevron, under other companies. And millions has been made from these people, from the destruction of land, destruction of their fishing community. Still today, from space, you can see the fires, the gas burning. Oil is taken, and as a byproduct of that, gas is released. Obviously, if that was to happen in a Western country, the gas would be capped, and that would be saved. In Nigeria, it's black people. We can, we can burn that. It's quicker. And these, these flares are burning night and day, releasing toxins, poisoning the land poisoning the earth. And that is still to be addressed. So Ken Sariwa died, was executed by the Nigerian government. Uh, Shell had a big hand in that. And still, 
the Agoni people are, are fighting for the, um, for the restitution of their land. The oil permeates the soil feet deep so that they cannot grow anything on that land. That is a, that is a, a war crime, it is a climate crime. Other people, notable people to mention, Wangari Matai, um, Kenya, who instituted a series of planting trees, Greenbelt Movement, and again, we, we, have, we have the idea of tree huggers from white activism, I suppose, but this, this is a direct response to the desolation of the environment, to actually plant trees. She got together a, a community of women and planted trees to protect the environment, to stop the flooding. Um, the chopping down of trees, we've seen the impact of that in places like Haiti. We've seen the, although it wasn't necessarily climate change related, the earthquake decimated Haiti because, particularly because floods were able to run across the land without having the barriers of trees to stop them. People have chopped the trees down because they haven't been able to have firewood. They need something to cook with. They ch ch chop down the trees. So we really need to relate all these fights. We need to look at Katrina, because that is, that is a, if we do, do need a warning, that is a warning that we saw on our TV screens from supposedly the richest country on earth, how, when it all breaks down, how people that look like us are treated, how we are disposable. We shouldn't forget 10 years ago this year that Katrina happened. One inspiring example of, of um, some of these impacts can be looked at in Cuba. Um, in Cuba, as well as climate change, we're facing a twin apocalypse, if you will, with peak oil. So Cuba has been embargoed. Um, peak oil, the idea that oil is taken from the ground, it's a, it, it takes millions of years, as we know, to create this oil from trees, from, from decaying matter. So this can't be replaced. We are running out of oil. We're running out of the accessible cheap oil in the ground. That is not going to be replaced anytime soon. So this is why we need alternative energy sources. But Cuba provides a good example of how that community, uh, under embargo from the United States, they were cut off, their oil supply was cut off, and they instituted programs such as community gardening, greening their gardening, greening the, the, uh, the areas in their cities. And that has had some success in restoring life, restoring health to people under severe pressure. So relating that back to ourselves, there's many examples. I, I work with um, a poet, Zena Edwards, who um, done lots of investigations into urban greening. And uh, we were on a, we were invited to a conference, Weatherfronts, uh, which was as we suspected, mainly all white uh, scientists talking about these issues, facts and figures. And Zena's reaction was naturally that, um, where is the community in this? Where, where, how, how am I gonna translate all these facts and figures to the people I see on the streets? And so Zena has been investigating lots of urban greening, if you want to will, that, that movement of people looking at their surroundings and planting food for themselves. And th that is a climate justice, that is a reparations action we can instigate, everyone can instigate, looking at how we eat, how we take our nourishment in. There's a, a project called May Project Gardens in London, which some of you may know about. This is a brother who has KMT, who's, who's transformed his house, he, he rents this house and he's transformed it into a permaculture garden. He invites people to come and, young people from the local area to come and, and look at uh, how food is grown, to look at how nature interacts. And that is a, a reparations movement, reclaiming our land, reclaiming our food. And all the, as I say, all this is connected. So. I mentioned a big amount of oil we get from um, the Niger Delta. So we are surrounded by Africa in this space, obviously the people, but these gadgets, these devices, people have mobile phones. We need to connect up how this ecology, these minerals are from the continent, particularly the Congo if we're talking about mobile technology. So we, that was mentioned yesterday. That is an ongoing, that is the, a continuation of the Maangamizi, the Holocaust of chattel colonial, neo-colonial enslavement is ongoing. 
and it's invisibilized unless we raise it up and connect the issues of this technology can enable, yeah, of course, but how are we going to use this technology in conveying these, these complexities of modern living, Western modern living? One other, how long do I have? Brother? How long do we have? Um, say another 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So one other um, connection would be the idea of flight. So within, within um, a lot of climate change discussion, you hear the, it's, the, onus, the, the onus is put on people to check their own behavior, to you know, stop driving as much, to uh, change the light bulb for instance. So changing a light bulb can only get us so far if we don't connect the justice issues into that. Um, one, of the, one of the things I think, one of the illustrations of that is that uh, air travel. I mean, air travel is not usually factored, factored in to emissions. Air travel is subsidized in terms of the emissions that, that is given off. But I would say, and I hopefully, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, that some of our travel is essential. We, we are not traveling uh, business class majority of us to, to go and uh, have a meeting. We are, we are connecting with family. We, we, are, we are a diaspora, so we need to connect with the continent, with, the, with our family overseas. So one of the demands I think we need to make is, is that, uh, Sister Khadija was saying, about opening borders and, and looking at travel and looking at how we connect. And this, the travel that is predominantly going on, someone was telling me that the inspiring, it was the sister there, that the inspiring, or I can't remember who it was, the inspiring action uh, that happened this week where the King's Cross was, was it yourself who was? No, no, it was the Fences and Elf. Aha, brilliant, yeah. Okay, so th there was an action last week, I think, where um, people were blockading business class people traveling the Eurotunnel. And th that was a brilliant action, I think, genius. And th that is more stuff we, we should be doing. We should be making those connections that if you're traveling to our continent, you're free to travel, but you're stopping our people from coming over here. And that, and that, that, that needs to be supported, and that needs to be, those connections need to be made. The, the, the free flow of money across borders, that, that's always happened. If you look at the, the trade from the Delta, from the Africa, from everywhere else, it, it mimics the triangular trade in enslaved Africans. Products are taken out still. That is still followed. We need to stop that. We need to halt it. We need to arrest that. And I think, relating back to nature outdoors, I, I loved what Brother Solomon, I think it was, was saying about um, saluting Earth. And I think, again, the, we're in an academic institution and, and we, we are taught, again, to value titles, to value the OBEs, the SIRs, the doctors, the professors. Uh, within this conference I mentioned I attended that there was lots of that, lots of people talking in facts and figures. What wasn't in the room was the, the real felt experience, which I know as African people we connect to. We, we communicate through art. Uh, Nawal El Sadawi, she, she imparted that uh, in, in the Egyptian culture, as she knows it, in African culture. There's no division between art and life. Art is in the way you drink, the way you walk, the way you make a cup of tea. Um, that's been divorced. Th these educations separate, classify, divide us. So felt experience is important. There are people who have experience of, of this huge issue, climate change, climate justice, people who are literally, the sea is rising around their feet, and they have the experience and knowledge of working the land, of working in harmony with the land, living on the land, which these big climate justice movements need to reach out to and go humbly in and say, how can you teach us? Not, we have the technology, you, we can help you. We need to be, go humbly back to the motherland, back to our diaspora, and, and learn the ways that have been forgotten and deliberately stolen from us. And there's a shaman who some of you may know uh, from Burkina Faso, Malid, uh, Patrice Maledomash, uh, so may. And, and he, he talks of, again, we mentioned hierarchies. He talks of the hierarchy of people. So he, he lists humans, plants, animals. Humans, animals, plants 
in reverse order. And that, that, I think, is what Brother Solomon was speaking to in that we need to humble ourselves and realise that trees have been around longer than us. We need to recognise that animals, if we listen, can teach us by their behaviour. We, we need to tune in to what, what is being said around us. That is, is not, maybe not be quantified in facts and figures and scientists, and there's not going to be a paper written on that. That is something we need to feel. We need to be in touch with nature, and we need to step out and be ourselves. I'll end with a poem. Um, this is um, a solidarity piece that was produced for Ken Sarwewa. And I was asked to write a poem around this idea of returning back, and this, this features in here. Also alongside here, there's, there's Ken's words. Again, the idea of art, dancing the guns to silent. This is what power we have as people to use our art to undermine. We don't have military power. We have power of our minds. We have power of our genius of being creative. Also on here is the Agoni Bill of Rights. So there are, there are reparations demands that have been made by many people. There's an indigenous people's conference which Kuj Chuhan from Virtual Migrants introduced me to, the Anchorage Declaration. That is a, a radical demand from indigenous peoples across the planet who got together and looked at the state of their lands and their, their soils and they demanded that fossil fuel extraction stop and cease. Look, look the Anchorage Declaration up to read that demand. So we need to be in solidarity. So this piece speaks to those issues. It mentions bus boycotts. So I'll just touch on this before I read it. Um, we talked about, I think Zita mentioned yesterday, the Montgomery bus boycott. The Bristol boycott we mentioned. In this poem I also mention the Alexandra bus boycott. The people know the Alexandra bus boycott. In brief, in 1957, the Public Utility Transport Corporation, PUTCO, in South Africa, raised the bus fare from 4D to 5D for commuters in Johannesburg. 80% of Johannesburg Africans lived under the poverty line. The raise was far more than they could afford. The black South Africans in Alexandra were outraged by the exploitation and of their own meagre wages. 7th of January 1957, Alexandrans launched a bus boycott exclaiming, as Iquela, we shall not ride. This was a rallying cry as they walked the 22 miles from Alexandra to Johannesburg rather than taking the bus. The boycott spread. At its height, 70,000 township residents refused to ride the local buses to and from work. In June, the South Africa government capitulated. The boycott won. So I think Brother Hakim mentioned the, the tools that we have at our disposal. The, the, um, I think it was in one of the panels from the 5th Pan-African Congress talking about our unconquerable tools are the boycott and the strike. So as masses, we have that power. We can choose not to spend our money on products that are damaging our community. We can choose to invest in wholesome earth nurturing products. We have that power. We can boycott destructive corporations. Return. The bus ticket reads return. Back to where you came from. How far is this journey for us? To return to the origin of things. To return to a time before monocrops of concrete and glass punched skyward fertilized by African blood. This journey begins with libation, a baptism of water, fire, burning free, remolding, rising again. We have been here before. Ocean and air breathe these deaths. Steel sinews hold muscle memory. Ecosystems oil the engine. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round and crack and judder and round. Turn, click, crunch, grate, burr, crash, drive, chain stroke, chain stroke, whip, whip, drive. 
a nighttime traffic over unpaved potholed roads directed into blind alleys, open waters, overboard, underboard, above board. The bus will be departing at sometime today, maybe tomorrow, at earliest convenience to our decolonized clocks, calling at all points from transatlantic triangle to Black Lives Matter, connecting Bristol to Montgomery to Alexandra to Ogoni. The wind whispers return. Head looking backward, the bird flies forward. We turn back to where we came from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.